All right, so I want to talk about the next uh, step, the next way forward in trying to build a kind of discussion across the country from coast to coast in a way that brings together people across ideology, across partisan ID tribes, liberal conservative, across demographics, race, and really desegregate conversation. And the purpose of this, as I said before, is to uh, really build on the common ground we stand on and common shared moral terrain and focus on what we have in common and what we believe in and agree on and see if we can move forward with the conversation and try to overcome a lot of these tribal uh, self-imposed barriers of, of hyper-polarization and of rigid dogmatism and partisan ideology that have been keeping us from sharing a kind of uh, moral and social arms race to try to flourish and find our answers. So you take a number of our problems, uh, one of them being the issue of uh, social justice on campuses and across the country, and attempts to try to tackle issues of human suffering and gender and race and uh, Muslims and things like that, and to try con to, to to point out that the, the, there really are genuine problems, genuine human suffering, and we have to find better ways to address that. But this issue has been uh, dealt with in probably the most polarizing and unpractical, nonsensical way possible. The way this is approached by ideologues on the left, at least much of the far dogmatic left, has been extremely antithetical to scientific way of thinking, to the Socratic way of having conversation, and has been about rid dogma and ways of seeing the world based on predefined categories of race and gender, say, uh, kind of a Mexican axis of oppression or intersectional politics. And there really is a need to talk about the intersection of different categories of human experience. You could be, you know, a person of color, you could also be obese, you could be uh, gay or lesbian, you could also be a Muslim, you could be a woman. There, there are ways these do intersect. The way they try to talk about intersectionality is fundamentally, in many cases at least, the way they talk about it is fundamentally unscientific. They assume they have the answer before they can ask questions. Rather than ask people what they're going through, rather than look at these experiences of people and different situations from the ground up, whether you talk about a black neighborhood and uh, dealing with police officers, you talk about Muslim women wearing the job, some of whom might want to wear it, they feel oppressed if they're stigmatized for wearing it. Others may not want to wear it, and they're slut shamed in calling it called a hijab by other Muslims. And there are times Muslims are treated in very uh, um, inexcusable, hurtful ways. And there are other times when minorities within Islam are also treated very badly. All of these things can find us consistently criticizing attacks on human dignity and also criticizing, you know, at least baiting ideas while standing up for the dignity of people. So you can criticize some things about. Uh, Islam or within Islam still stand up for Muslims. You can also criticize the far right. You can criticize the political correctness of the far left while consistently standing up for other people, dignity of human beings, and trying to arrive at answers by way of the scientific way of thinking. And this will this will lead you to step outside of an ideological box and, and pretty much tackle bad ideas and bad arguments wherever you see them. And this, the main axis here should not be left versus right. It should not be liberal versus conservative. It should be reason and scientific thinking and logic versus bad ideas and bad arguments and, and dogmatism and fundamentalism. It could also be compassion and, and moral sincerity versus tribalism and uh, the suppression of individual dignity and human dignity. So you could be, if we stand on these two pillars of reason, compassion, and rational scientific thinking, we can arrive at better answers and find far better ways to reclaim this conversation about social justice, reclaim it away from ideology and in the hands of reason, scientific discourse, and compassion, uh, genuine uh, outreach, and, and humanizing conversation. And this is a better roadmap, not only to understand to our dance, but to be humble enough to ask the right questions and admit that we don't have the answer to every single situation. Rather than approach through the lens of ideology, let's, check, let's have a science of social justice. Let's bridge the scientific and the skeptic community with social activism and with poor neighborhoods and black neighborhoods across the country. Let's find ways to foster conversation and inculcate a kind of revival of skepticism and critical thinking in a more passionate way to deal with these issues. So the first step that we're going to try to do, or one of the first shows we're going to try to do with a reason revival, is we're going to take somebody. We take an activist from Black Lives Matter, and we're going to take someone who's a retired police officer who can speak freely and talk about better and worse ways to police neighborhoods and many of the problems that cops face when they deal with this, and, and ways the system is broken, and ways that most most cops want to find, you know, they want to build a report, they want to build a dialogue, and they want better answers, or at least they want to be able to um, exercise their policing in an area. You, you know, and, and they don't wake up every morning wanting um, to further build on this kind of basic divisive tribalism across across the country. They don't want to foster more distrust and, and breaking social contract black communities. There are plenty of bad cops and that needs to be called out. There are also deficits in training depending on where you go. That also needs to be tackled. But the idea that we just stigmatize most cops is a fundamental itself divisive, debating, and hurtful idea that at its very core is go against the very kind of dialogue we need to build. At the same time, most people in the activist community are sig in Black Lives Matter are stigmatized by the way as being unwashed, uh, you know, morally reprehensible degenerates that are in these ideological leftist who just have a Marxist agenda and are discredited as, as, as activists and sometimes as people. This is also fundamentally wrong. There are plenty of bad apples within the activism, but there's plenty of unscrupulous social justice warrior douchebags that we have to call out. But the best way to do that is to show an alternative in having this conversation and to build a scientific rational framework of reason, compassion, and logic, and Socratic discussion that can better arrive at these answers or at least better have conversations. You can't throw out the issue. If, you, if you're a conservative, you refuse to talk 
about these issues. You hand over the conversation to Black Lives Matter. You hand over the conversation to the left. This should not be a divisive ideological issue. Polarize the law to fall lines of the left versus the right. This, this should be a fundamental issue of human dignity, of better ways to understand the problem via scientific discussion. If that becomes the axis, then we'll realign the way we have conversation. The real axis here is not left versus right. It's, it's, it's scientific thinking versus dogmatism. And human compassion, moral sincerity versus tribalism. Let's look through that lens. Let's bring activism black lives, sitting down with retired police. Let's get the veterans. Um, you know, myself, a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan. I was part of uh, the special warfare community and the human terrain system of white anthropology and for the defense department as well. And in, in both these series of, of, uh, of work I did, we, we were was part of a small community whose job was to build an understanding with the human population by understanding the human and social terrain, the behavioral dynamics, the cultural and social aspects and dimensions of of, of what's going on in the population and, and avoid misunderstanding between villages and brigade combat teams. Negotiate with uh, tribal elders, with leaders, sometimes with Afghan lords, and better understand how to have, and how to build dialogue on, and, and connect with people uh, on a cultural level and build that kind of rapport. And anyone who's uh, any veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan can tell you, almost anyone in the police force has been there often too. It is in the interest of someone to build rapport with the community they're in. If they marginalize population of people that are not yet radicalized. You are doing a disservice to your very ability to work that with, to work with that populace to better understand the problem and better build relationships. So it, it, this paradigm that we have now with uh, many of our police policies is absolutely reprehensible. It, it does a disservice to the police in uniform. It does a disservice to the people in the community. It also is a disservice to science and the scientific method, which has better to work at answers than political analysis. At the same time, and most any cop with a decent experience can do this. Send me a room full of cops and I'll be happy to have this conversation. Send me a room full of uh, war veterans who've had experience with counterinsurgency. We'll have the same discussion. At the same time, you know, I've spent a million time talking activists in black neighborhoods. They tend to agree. If, if you, if there are good, bad ways to police, and the way the activist community has learned about this in many spheres of our campuses, and then our media, with our polarizing satellite media, this based on talking points and this false binary of us versus them, that's also the wrong way to go about it. The activist community is often going about it fundamentally the wrong way. This whole thing is unacceptable. We do better. We need a new center, an emerging third voice in this country, a new center of reason based compassion and scientific thing. So look at veterans. Police, retired police, black police activists, and people who've lived in these communities, these marginalized poor communities, black and Hispanic, they're, you know, all across Brooklyn, parts of New York, and Hatton, where I live right now. Let's work to build these dialogues and make them a shared public conversation to try to build a bridge between scientific thinking and political activism. If we can do this, we can bridge a gap that is historically unprecedented but more needed ever. Let's uh, try to move forward. It's uh, www.resurvival.net. Try to upgrade the quality of these videos, which are evidently awful at the moment, and we will go from there. Cheers.